actually, on some level, time management is the main challenge of life. Time management in light of the fact that one day you're going to die. Elon Musk solved the problem of death and we could just live for forever. Um, if it was really forever, I think that would be uh, absolutely terrible in, in every single way. You know, I think it's really useful and beneficial to have some activities in your life that you just do for their own sake. We're going to start right at the beginning. Of course, your most recent book is 4,000 Weeks, Time Management for Mortals. Um, and it's not really the kind of book you maybe expect from the title. I think you have quite a different definition of time management and productivity and those associated terms. So could you maybe begin by telling us what you think are the issues with the way people tend to understand time management and how you would go about redefining it, at least at a basic level, before we get into the detail? Totally. And I apologize in advance if I'm going to be a bit relentlessly promotional about a book I've got coming out in a few weeks' time called Meditations for Mortals, which is on similar theme. And it's what, I mean, it, it develops it, I think, but it's where my head is at at the moment. Uh, so apologies. And you can just cut me off and tell me that I'm, uh, I'm being too, uh, being too promotional. Um, I, I mean, I've always been obsessed on some level, uh, going back to my time at Cambridge University, which uh, in which I was an absolute ball of anxiety with um, using my time as, as, as well as I can and trying to feel in control of it and trying to feel like I don't have to disappoint anybody and I can meet all the deadlines. And then journalism will, uh, you know, reinforce uh, a lot of that. But what really struck me is I got to the point of writing 4,000 weeks after, our, you know, several decades as an adult finding that these things didn't didn't work the way they were promised was that actually on some level time management is the main challenge of life right i mean if you're going to really take seriously the fact that you've got finite time in the day finite time in a life and figure out what you're how you're actually supposed to relate to that to that situation then i guess you're doing time management but it seems like something a bit deeper and more important than what we usually mean by that phrase. And anyway, in the subtitle of the book, Time Management for Mortals, I just kind of like the combination of a very sort of mundane idea with a very, um, you know, grandiose one. So it's like, yeah, time management in light of the fact that one day you're going to die. Uh, this is a bit of a, your, your, the way you've described that kind of got a question uh, popping into my head now. How do you think time management would be different if we weren't mortal, if we were immortal? Ha. Yeah, it's an interesting question and one that one or two kind of people with a from a Christian background have sometimes sort of issued a challenge to me. It's like, well, I don't believe that we're that we're mortal. So so how does this how does this change things? Um I think if what you mean is life just extended on forever. Mm -hmm. So putting aside sort of um more interesting ideas about what eternal life might mean. You just literally mean like you never died. Peter Thiel Elon Musk solved the problem of death and we could just live for forever. Um, if it was really forever, I think that would be uh, absolutely terrible in, in every single way. And one of the things I, I've i written about is like, you know, it, 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 it's, it's sometimes a bit hard to get your mind around, but if you live forever, then the question of like, should I do this today or should I do it tomorrow? Or should I do X with my day to day or should I do Y? Like the fundamental questions of building a meaningful life, the answer would always be like, who cares, right? Because you've got all the time in the world, literally. Um, now, if what really happened was that we just lived till we were like 200 or something, which I think is probably what a lot of these kind of Silicon Valley hype about um, solving death is about, um, that's a different matter. I can I can see some upsides. I think we would just replicate all the same problems though, and it would just seem like not enough very quickly. So I just want to zero in and maybe make the conversation a little bit more mundane, maybe between different approaches that mortals might take to time management. I think what I meant by the rebranding that you particularly take is that time management really has a lot of associations with productivity. How well can we use our time? What can we get done how much work what can we tick off the to-do list uh busyness for example has been rebranded as hustle yeah um what do you see as being wrong with that approach of using time in that way um and in using time as something effectively where you're kind of trying to gain an advantage uh for some future self right i mean i think the fundamental problem you hint at in in the end of that question which is that 
if you take that purely instrumental approach to time, you're always trying to optimize. You're always trying to get to the situation where you can do more in order to become this better person later on, or in order to realize these goals later on, in order to make a certain amount of money later on. You, your whole life is later on. And the whole sort of meaning of your life is postponed uh, out into the the future. And you sort of never actually uh, kind of finding value in, 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 in the present. I think also just that whole notion of light of time as something that is like a resource that it's up to us to use as well as we can. It's not untrue. Um, we all have to approach life like that a bit, but I think it's something that like pre-industrial people would have been completely confused by this idea that time is a resource. And I think that if you go too far down that, at, uh, uh, down that avenue, you know, into that mindset, it really does kind of squelch something that is very important to the meaning of life, which is the, that, the sort of ability to feel like timelessness, like you're just sort of fully absorbed in the, in the moment. Mm, the pinnacle of that for me, actually, and you mentioned it in the book, but it reminded me of a couple of years ago, my dad bought a book, which was something like rest better to work better, right? And even the idea that leisure, which should be an activity which is intrinsically valuable in itself, has become instrumentally valuable for work, for something else we can extract out of ourselves. So um, maybe you could tell us a little bit about the importance of hobbies and the atelic activity for kind of getting a bit more in tune with time management for intrinsic worth as opposed to instrumental. Yeah, no, this is the same point, but it's more a question of, as you say, like what you could do about it, which is that, you know, I think it's really useful and beneficial to have some activities in your life that you just do for their own sake. Um, that I write in 4,000 Weeks about hiking in my case, right? It's a sort of good example of a so-called atelic activity, an activity without an, an end that, that doesn't get its meaning from its, from its destination. Because like, you know, the quickest way to reach your destination when you go on a hike is just not to go on the hike. Um, like it, it, you're, you're not doing it in order to get anywhere. There are sort of side benefits in terms of cardiovascular health, but that's not really why most people say, no, why I go, go hiking. Um, and then I also give the example uh, of sort of hobbies that you're kind of not even that good at. I think can be really can often people find a huge amount of freedom in in those. Um, I wrote in the book about um, Rod Stewart's incredibly elaborate model train system, which is like a nothing to do with his like personal branding as a rock star. If anything, it works against it. Um, and secondly, by all accounts, he's like you know he has to hire people to build all the special bits of his difficult bits of his model railway network, and he's obviously got the money to do that. So he's not even that that skilled at it. But it, precisely because of that, I think you can sort of lose yourself in an activity sometimes because it doesn't have those, those pressures. And I talk about like my, my own fondness for um, cheesy piano rock uh, playing on a keyboard here with my headphones in. So no one else has to listen to me. Like writing is the thing I do as a job and I hope I'm good at it and I want to get better at it, but it's quite high pressure because you sort of want it to work out um, and you want to earn a living by it. Uh, but no, I'm never going to earn a living by my piano playing. And that actually makes it more fun in a way. Hey guys, hope you enjoyed that clip from our interview with Oliver Berkman. If you'd like to check out the full interview, you can click right here. Make sure to like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video. And drop a comment with your thoughts down below. Stay tuned and see you next time.